So good morning, everyone. Morning, ma'am. Everybody's okay. We're all doing fine. Yes, ma'am. Right. Yes, ma'am. So um, last time I had a class with you on Haemophilus. Remember, which uh, was uh, postponed because of the MBBS exam that was going on in LT1. Okay. So in addition to introduction to mycology and superficial mycosis, at the end I will cover just a brief uh, overview on the Haemophilus part also. So we will have both the lectures combined and attendance will go for both of them. Okay, all right. So let's start with introduction to mycology. What is mycology? It is basically the study of fungi. Okay, fungus in Latin means mushroom. Similarly, mycus in uh, Greek means also mushroom. Okay, so we have mycology, the branch of biological science that deals with the study of fungi. Now, medical mycology, on the other hand, is whatever you're studying for the fungal diseases found among human beings. So you have epidemiology, ecology, pathogenesis, diagnosis, and whatever therapeutic options we have for these fungal diseases that will be studied as part of medical mycology. And uh, today's topic is an introduction into this mycology aspect. Okay. So fungi are a chlorophyllous, no chlorophyll. Okay, they don't have chlorophyll, they're eukaryotic organisms. They multiply sexually or asexually with production of spore. But like plants, uh, unlike plants, they cannot produce their own food because they don't have chlorophyll. Okay. All right. So mycosis, which um, if you individually say for a single disease, it will be a mycosis. The diseases of warm-blooded animals that are caused by fungi. Okay. So these are mycosis. So this term you have to remember. What is a mycosis? Mycosis is, is a... A fungal infection of warm-blooded animals. Okay, there are about 600 fungal species which uh, can cause uh, infection in humans, and you can just have a note that this father of medical mycology is Raymond Saberoth. Okay, his full name Raymond Jacques Adrian Saberoth. Okay, right now the fungal cell wall uh, consists of nanoproteins here. Then you have glucans, then a chitin layer. Okay and a cell membrane with membrane proteins okay so this is your basic fungal cell wall you might uh, you can you can you can note this down you can read it also and you can try drawing it all right so how do you divide fungi fungi you can divide into yeast yeast like molds or filament mycelial dimorphics and dematicious fungi okay so yes, these actually they divide by proper budding. Okay, so they will bud and they will separate. Okay, so you have example like Cryptococcus and Saccharomyces. Yeast likes, they also bud, but they fail to separate. Instead, they will form pseudo hyphae. Okay, so the yeast like uh, fungi are example candida species. Okay, molds, as you are well aware of, you can see molds growing sometimes well on on surfaces, on bread also, if you leave it outside for a long time. So you have molds. Molds may, examples, your common ones will be Aspergillus species, Penicillium, and Rhizopus, okay? Even Dermatophytes, they are also, uh, these are very important for human infection, okay? Then you have dimorphic fungi. Dimorphism means two forms, okay? Dimorphic. So you have, it exists as a yeast when you grow it at 37 degrees Celsius. And if you grow it at 22 degrees Celsius, it will give a mold or mycelial form. Okay, so your example of dimorphic fungi are your histoplasma, uh, blastomyces, coccidioides, and so on. Okay, then you have dermatitious fungi, which are dark colored fungi um, with dark uh, hyphae. You have curvularia, alternaria, bipolaris, cladosporium. Okay, so now in a basic overview on how to diagnose a fungal infection. Okay, so if you have a superficial uh, mycosis, with every diagnosis other than your clinical, um, other than your clinical diagnosis, you have to do a laboratory diagnosis also. So in in laboratory diagnosis, the first important thing is what sample you will collect. Okay, the sample you will collect depends on the site of involvement of the infection okay so in superficial mycosis i will go into what a superficial mycosis is then you can take hair and skin okay then you can take uh, nail clippings okay 
and if you're looking at something deeper okay then like systemic okay or system uh, like bloodstream then you can take a blood infection if you have a meningitis caused by a fungus then you can have a csf okay if a fungus is causing some deep seated tissue infection then you can have a tissue biopsy from it and so on aspirates you just aspirate from the wound area okay then when you have to plate it out into its uh, medias okay just like bacterial culture we also do fungal culture so in fungal culture various medias will be involved you can utilize different different combinations of media and then when you grow the fungus in in the culture you can examine it macroscopically as in the gross morphology and microscopically okay then in macroscopic examination what you will look for you will look for the texture and color of the colony okay in its upper and lower sides okay so there will be a culture i will show you what it looks like so the upper side is called the reverse uh, the obverse and the lower side is called the reverse okay and then you must note if there is any diffusible pigment in the medium okay you see the type of colony is it a mold is it like what kind of mold it is okay is it yeast like or is it filamentous okay so this is um, i can show you like this in a tube when you look at the tube when you look directly from from the surface this is the direct observation okay so the upper part is called the obverse okay when you look from the back so you are looking at the lower portion of the colony that is the reverse okay so like this only this is obverse like directly you are seeing directly on the plate whatever is growing and this is reverse from the back okay so from the back you can note that um from here also from the front you can from the obverse you can see any what is the type of colony is there any pigmentation or not in the reverse you can see if there's any diffusible pigment or not okay here you can just note the color of the colony here but there is no diffusible pigment if there was a pigment this whole thing would be red okay but uh, you are seeing here the reverse okay likewise this is as i said this is the obverse and this is the reverse okay so each tube obverse reverse this is the obverse this is the reverse portion of this tube then you have this obverse and this is the reverse portion okay so like that you'll have to observe the morphology of the uh, colony at the same time you have to see that what time is it growing what temperature is it growing in how long did it take to grow okay so fungal culture on an average we keep it from one week to four weeks or even longer depending on the fungus that you're suspecting okay sometimes it may not grow in the second week then we incubate it a little bit more then you see it by the third week if not then by the fourth week and so on okay so at the end of the fourth week if nothing is growing then we can presumptively say that it is sterile nothing has grown okay no fungus has grown so this is a, a typical mold colony this is also mold this is what you're seeing a waxy uh, colony here this is a yeast okay so like that you will see the colonies some of this this is black this colony is black pigmented this is green pigment and this is white pigmented this is just an example of what a fungus colony in a culture tube looks like okay then you have you come up once you uh, see the colony you have made a presumptive diagnosis looking at the colony yes it it might be this fungus so you have to take a mount koh mount uh, lpcb mount preparation okay so you make a needle mount you take a needle there is a special needle and an l shaped loop made uh, available in mycology for this so you pick pick that colony and you place it in the glass uh, glass light which is containing a dye okay this is called lactophenol cotton blue there is a drop of lpcb on the glass on the glass light in that you place your colony okay then you cover it with a cover slip and examine under the microscope to see how the fungus is growing okay so inside the microscope this is an lpcb mount showing your characteristic fungus okay so uh, for example this is a, a picture of an aspergillus okay aspergillus in lpcb looks like this then you have another thing here you have a yeast form right on the yeast it looks like this okay so this is a mold and this is a yeast if anyone is having confusion you can stop me and ask me questions okay so another example these are all molds okay when you look at molds you have to look at the hyphae okay then the macroconidia and the small small microconidia these are macroconidia this is microconidia 
So you have to see what is the pattern, what is the arrangement, how is it budding, how is the septa, septa dividing, you know, all that. You'll have to see all that, okay? So that's how we do a fungal uh, uh, microscopic examination. Then after that, once you come to the uh, organism, you, now you know what organism it is. So you can put up an antifungal susceptibility testing. Like bacteria. Bacteria, we do antimicrobial or antibiotic susceptibility testing, right? So for fungus, you will do an antifungal susceptibility testing, okay? So you can, there are different, different anti, antifungal drugs. So some of them, they require the disc diffusion and some they require the micro dilution method, okay? Then this is just an example of a disc diffusion. This fungus is growing. We have placed an anti, antifungal disc here. And this zone of inhibition, we will measure and see it is susceptible or not to that antifungal. And this is a micro broth uh, dilution test, okay? You don't need to go into what it is. You can just know that there are this diffusion methods as well as micro dilution method for antifungal susceptibility, okay? To see which antifungal medication, which antifungal drug is going to be effective against that particular fungus, okay? Now, then in addition, we also do a histopathological diagnosis, okay? To establish diagnosis of fungal disease, identification should be made by a combination of mycologic as well as histopathologic study. Okay, histopathologic study means from studying the, for example, the, uh, the, the histopathology staining you can do uh, on a biopsy sample, for example, and then see how it is in the tissue. Although many fungi can be seen with hematoxylin and eosin, some are not stained. So, you can do special stains for the fungi, okay? Here also we can use periodic acid shift, gomori metanamine silver stain, you can do music carmine and grid lace, okay? This is what a periodic acid shift stain looks like. This was a biopsy and here we are seeing this hyphae, right? This hyphae we are seeing in the tissue, okay? In the same way, gomori metanamine silver is staining this. Look at this fungal structure here. You are seeing a mold, okay? Like that. For this is a yeast form. Then his hematoxylin eosin also. You're just seeing these either the yeast forms or you can see the sclerotic bodies or you can see the hyphal forms, okay? And music carmine. These are just some uh, special stains that you will use in mycology. So if you enumerate them, Enumerate uh, special stains for fungi. You can write this uh, periodic acid shift, Gomori B. metanamine silver stain, Mayer's music carmine, and Gridley stain. Okay, you can also do a toluidine blue stain also. Then we have India ink. India ink is used for visualization of capsules. Okay, so you know that there is a fungus called a Cryptococcus neoformans. Uh, which is kind of a dangerous pathogen when it comes to a CSF infection because these patients don't live very long if they get a CSF infection of cryptococcus, okay? So to rapidly diagnose it, we do a direct India ink on the CSF sample. In the CSF sample, the India ink is a negative staining method. It stains the background, okay? Black. But it doesn't stain the fungus and its capsule. So this is the fungus. And this is the capsule around the fungus, okay? So this is appearing as a halo, a halo around the yeast cell, okay? And when it is budding, the halo is covering both the parent and the daughter yeast cell together like this, okay? So this is what Cryptococcus neoformans and its capsule looks like on India ink staining, okay? Right, now we come to the mycosis in detail. Mycosis, uh, they can be superficial, cutaneous, subcutaneous, and systemic mycosis, okay? Superficial mycosis involve only the skin, the outermost layer of skin and its appendages, okay? Cutaneous mycosis goes deeper into the epidermis as well as involves the hair and the nail, okay? Subcutaneous mycosis involves the dermis, subcutaneous tissue, muscle, and fasci, okay? Then you have deep mycosis, which are, you know, your systemic mycosis caused by pathogenic or opportunistic fungi. When opportunistic fungi cause an infection, they can, they are called opportunistic mycosis. Usually they are systemic, but it can be otherwise also. Superficial fungal infection. As I said, they involve your, mainly your skin, okay? 
and that in that there is a subset for cutaneous mycosis also. All right. Skin and mucous membrane. So example is pityriasis, uh, pityriasis versicolor. Okay. Then you can have an ear infection by Aspergillus species. Okay. Nail infection, which is also known as onychomycosis because of Candida and Aspergillus. You can remember one two example of each. Okay. Uh, you can have a dermatophyte infection of hair. Okay. And keratomycosis of your conjunctiva. Okay. Uh, of your cornea, sorry, cornea. So you have your, uh, these are ex examples. So you can see now. So the lesion will be where the inoculation has taken place. Most often they are followed uh, after a traumatic uh, injury has occurred to that area. So there is an inoculation of the fungus or the spore of the fungus inside that. Okay. Those subcutaneous mycosis usually cause only, they are only localized. Okay. So the examples here, you have chromoblastomycosis, protrichosis, uh, zygomycosis, mycetoma, then superficial mycosis. They are limited to the outermost layer of the skin. For infections, you will uh, remember, pityriasis versicolor, as I said, the tinias, tinia nigra, black pydra, and white pydra. Okay. Then they do not elicit, because they are only involving the outermost layer of the skin, they will not elicit an immune response, okay? There's usually, usually no discomfort to the patient. It only causes cosmetic problems. It just appears a bit different, okay? Like pigmented or some mild rash is there, okay? So, pityriasis versicolor is caused by the fungus Malassezia furfur, also known as pityrosporum orbicular, okay? It's a lipophilic yeast-like organism, it affects the areas which are rich in sebaceous glands, okay? Which are the areas rich in sebaceous glands? The ones which produce a lot of sebum, okay? Like your intertrigenous areas, you know? Your scalp uh, and your face also, okay? Then, so it grows med in media which are nicely supplemented with fatty acid. They can exist in budding yeast, occasionally hyphal, okay? So when you make a KOH preparation, a fungal KOH mount with your specimen of the skin scraping um, this is what you will find these are hyphae short short hyphae and yeast okay okay so you have hyphae as well as yeast that's why it is called spaghetti and meatballs okay as i said here spaghetti and meatballs appearance spaghetti long long spaghettis and meatballs okay the yeast form as well as the hyphae so Clinically, you will find the lesion in the torso, arms, and abdomen, okay? Very lightly have uh, pigmented areas, okay? They scale, sometimes they're chalky, and sometimes they grow, grow some folliculitis. Small, small follicles will be inflamed also, okay? So this is what pityriasis versicolor looks like. It's a fungal infection, all right? So to come to its diagnosis, you'll have to have a clinical suspicion looking at this kind of a picture. Then you have to see the skin scraping and put up a fungal culture also. Skin scraping, you will see the spaghetti and meatballs appearance. Okay, like this. This is a proper KOH mount. Here you can see this yeast as well as hyphal forms. Okay, the treatment is with azoles. Now, it come to tinea nigra. It's a superficial chronic infection of the stratum corneum of the skin. Okay, the, it is caused by Exophiala vernicae. Okay and commonly found in tropical areas. You will find a brownish discoloration, a macula, on the palms, on the fingers, and on the face. A brownish macula. Okay, this brownish discoloration you are seeing here like this. These are maculae because they are not raised. They are just on the surface. Okay. So, here you will find uh, on microscopy, you find septated hyphae and you will see yeast cells. Okay. Then, when you grow the colony on SDA, it will grow black colored colony. Okay, treatment is with salicylic acid. You just have to apply uh, locally. Black pydra. This is a fungal infection of the scalp hair. This is the hair. Okay, this is the hair, and here you are seeing something black here, right? Yeah, this is a fungal infection of the hair. Okay, in the scalp. So, it's caused by Pidriaia horte. Frequent again in tropical areas. So in India, you will see this. 
clinical findings you will see hard dark brown to black nodules on the hair so the hair has some black black uh, nodule okay or some dark brown nodule on the hair then you can suspect black pydra okay which is also a fungal infection then when you look at the microscopic finding you will find septate pigmented hyphae as sky okay unicellular and uh, forget about this these are polar filaments uh, you have culture um Brown to black colonies, as I said. Again, your treatment is with topical salicylic acid and azole creams. Okay. White pidra is a fungal infection of the facial, axillary, or genital hair. Black pidra was on your scalp hair. Okay. But this white pidra is on the face, on the axilla, the armpits, or the genital hair. Okay. The hair of that area. It is caused by a trichosporon, which is a yeast. Okay. Okay. And this is found in tropical and temperate zones. Again, you will find it here also. Hmm. Then, you, in microscopic examination later, you will find septate hyphae that develop into atroconidia. Forget about this. It might be too much right now. Uh, the hair has a soft, pasty, cream-colored growth. Okay, on the hair only, it will be white. White, creamy growth on the hair. So, you can suspect uh, white pidra. Okay. So, treatment is uh, removal of the organism by using these medications including salicylic acid and meconazole. Okay. Then, now you come to keratomycosis. Kerato means cornea, mycosis is fungal infection of your warm-blooded animals, right? Keratomycosis, also known as mycotic keratitis. This is usually because of trauma or after surgery, okay? So let's say, for example, somebody was working and uh, they got a little splinter of wood into their eye. Okay, so after that, they have developed a fungal infection. So this, this is the condition, keratomycosis. Okay, or maybe let's say that somebody had eye surgery and then developed a fungal infection on the cornea. Okay, so that's a keratomycosis. Okay, so this is, as expected, uh, most commonly caused by your saprophytic fungi which are normally present in the environment, okay? Normally, they don't cause infection, but given these situations, it can come and cause an infection, okay? So, your common culprits here are Aspergillus, Fusarium species, Alternaria species, and even your Candida and Histoplasma, okay? Clinically, what you will find? An ulcer on the cornea, okay? So, you will find the hyphae in the corneal scraping and then you'll have to culture and then see what is growing and then do the further testing, okay? We, just like bacteria, we involve uh, culture as well as biochemical testing as well as other additional tests to diagnose a fungal infection, okay? So, depending on the fungus, you will proceed accordingly, okay? Treatment, now you have to do a keratoplasty. You have to treat the cornea. You have to give... Uh, topical amphotericin B or nystatin, okay, or pimericin. Then you come to cutaneous mycosis. They can involve the skin, they can involve the hair, they can involve the nails, the deeper part of the skin, including the epidermis, okay. So now because they are involving a deeper uh, part of the, of the skin, so it will evoke a cellular immune response, okay. Most common uh, cutaneous mycosis causes are because of dermatophytes. Okay, we will go into this. So, so clinically what you will see is a ringworm. Okay, you, I think most of you are familiar with the term ringworm. Yeah, so this is it. Okay, so dermatophytosis is uh, also known as tinea or ringworm. Why ringworm? Because of this spherical, like this kind of circular, circular ring-like lesion. Okay. It's not a worm, it's just the appearance, okay? The infection of the skin, hair, or nails caused by a group of uh, keratinophilic fungi called dermatophytes, is called dermatophytosis or tinea. Can be come, it can come as a short note in your exam, okay? Or you can have a long question on uh, superficial mycosis, or even a deep mycosis, systemic mycosis. So anything can be a particular um, long question, okay? Or you might get individually as tinea. You just write, for example, let's say you got a short note on tinea. Then you'll have to write that it's caused by dermatophytes 
This is an infection of skin hair nails. Okay, those dermatophytes, they are keratinophilic. That's why they invade that skin. Okay, then they cause a cellular immune response. Okay, then, uh, you know, the clinical manifestation is tinea. Okay, so they belong to phylum deuteromycota. They are hyaline molds. Hyaline means non color translucent molds. Okay, they're transparent. They are white. Okay. Um, now, among the dermatophytes, the most important uh, genuses are these three Microsporum, Epidermophyton, and Trichophyton. These are your three important dermatophytes. Okay. Microsporum invades your hair and skin. Epidermophyton affects your skin and nail. Trichophyton, on the other hand, affects both hair, all hair, skin, and nail. Okay, so one is hair and skin, microsporum. Skin and nail, epidermophyton. And hair, skin, nail is trichophyton. Okay, so they're classified, dermatophytosis, they're classified, the tinea, uh, depending on the anatomic location or the ecologic location. Okay. Anatomic location means where the lesion is present, okay? And ecologic location is means from where it is coming. Is it from the soil? Is it from animals? Is it from humans? Okay, so that and then your anatomic location depending on which part of the body is uh, involved, okay? Anthropophilic means associated with humans only, so you will get from person to person transmission, okay? So if there is someone with uh, a dermatophytosis, is, is uh, sharing a comb, head, etc. with some other, someone else, okay? That other person can get the infection, okay? If it is an anthropophilic fungus, okay? If it's zoophilic, then you get it in contact with animals. So there will be direct transmission from animals to humans by close contact, okay? Geophilic usually found in soil, so transmitted to humans by direct exposure, like for example, opening into a wound or so. Okay, dermatophytes are keratinophilic and resistant to cyclohexamide, which is why we use media like SCCA containing cyclohexamide to, uh, in, to enhance the growth of this dermatophyte and suppress the other fungi. Okay, so as I said, the three important species, uh, uh, genuses are trico microsporum, trichophyton, and epidermophyton. Okay, now when you look at a hair infection, when the infection involves only the hair shaft uh, beneath the uh, cuticle, okay, the hair shaft, that means the outside part, it is called an ectotrix, okay. When the in, uh, fungal infection involves inside, inside into the hair shaft and the cuticle is intact, then it's called an endotrix, okay. So, types of dermatophytic infections, you can have an acute or inflammatory type, or a chronic or non-inflammatory type of infection. Acute or inflammatory type is associated with cell-mediated immunity to the fungus and it heals by itself or responds very nicely to treatment. Whereas chronic or non-inflammatory type, because it's non-inflammatory, it, it doesn't express a cell-mediated immunity, okay? And thus, it will come and go, it will relapse, that means it will be, it will get well, then it will come back, it will get well, then it will come back again. Or it can respond very poorly to treatment. So, the patient is taking medication, it may not work or it may look like it's healing and then come back later. Okay, so this is a chronic or non-inflammatory type of infection. So, uh, dermatophytosis, usually they occur uh, in crowded living conditions where there's a lot of moisture and uh, humidity involved, contact and trauma with the associated factors like geophilic and all that, or, or zoophilic or anthropophilic. Then you have, uh, if you have a cellular immunodeficiency in the patient, then it can have a chance to go into chronic infection. Okay. Reinfection is possible after once the patient gets well, but a large inoculum is needed at that time. And it usually... Uh, results faster okay so now to accord the clinical classification is based according to the anatomic location involved so you have tinea barbie which means in the beard area so okay beard and mustache area so it will be tinea barbe okay so you know na barber okay so you have tinea barbe 
Then tinea pedis means whatever happens on the tinea that happens on the legs, on the feet. Also known as athlete's foot. Okay. Then you have tinea corporis means the whole body, the body area, the torso and all that. Tinea manuum is the tinea that happens on the hands. Okay. Tinea capitis means capitis means head. So whatever happens on the head is a tinea capitis. Tinea angium is whatever tinea that occurs in the nails. And tinea cruris is the, uh, the jock area. Okay. So you, in, when you look at the skin, it will be, you see circular, dry, eridematous, redded, reddened, scaly, itchy lesions on the skin. Okay. In the hair, you will see the typical lesions or there will be loss of hair or there will be a loss of hair called alopecia or there will be scars on the hair, on the uh, scalp and hair. Then you have, if there is a nail infection, there will be a thickened, deformed, a uh, very brittle, discolored nail. Maybe there will be some debris under the nail. Okay, so it's called subangle debris accumulation. Okay, and you can have favors or whitening. Okay, now this is tinea pedis. This is the tinea. See this uh, circular ring worm like ring like lesion here. Tinea of feet. Okay, so this tinea pedis. Tinea angium, okay, white friable nail with some deposit under the nail bed, okay, there's a discoloration, there's a thickening, the nail is very brittle, or you can say it is friable, okay, then in scalp, you can have uh, alopecia, look at this patient, he has lost his scalp hair, okay, alright, then you have tinea barbie in the beard and mustache area, and this is the jock area, so you have tinea cruris here, Okay, then you come to his diagnosis. Clinically, you can just see the appearance of the patient as well as uh, look for fluorescence under wood slam. Wood slam is a UV lamp uh, run at 365 nanometer wavelength. So when you put the wood slam, the fungus will fluoresce. Okay, all right. Then you have a laboratory diagnosis, as I said, with the sample collection, depending on the area. Then you do a direct microscopy examination by putting it into it in 10 to 40 percent, uh, 10 to 25 percent KOH. Okay, so uh, you you can see the hair. Okay, you can see the skin. Then whatever sample you're collecting, normally we use a blunt uh, scalpel to just scrape off this lesion, and then we collect it in a sterile paper okay take some of it and make a mount with with your koh about 10 percent to 20 percent koh you will put here and then wait for 10 15 minutes to dissolve the the cells and then you will see the fungus properly okay and this from the remaining you can put it up for fungal culture okay then um See, this is what I said. This is the hair shaft and this fungus is outside, right? You can see it outside. What does that mean? This is a ectotrix. Okay, these are the fungal yeast cells here, you can see. And it is outside the hair shaft. This is ectotrix. If you see this kind of thing inside the hair shaft, it will be an endotrix. Okay, so you can uh, do a fluorescent microscopy um, of the of the micros uh, of the fungus of the sample then you will see this fungus which will fluoresce apple green and then you are seeing this septation in the hyphae right and this is no doubt a fungus okay a fungal hyphae you are seeing here okay like this this is calcofluor white okay this is also a fluorescent dye and you are using it to stain and see this uh, fungi under fluorescent light okay then you can culture as i said so various media are used, okay? One of them is uh, named after our uh, father of medical mycology, Raymond Seborot, okay? So this culture media is Seborot's dextrose agar, okay? The most commonly used fungal culture media, please remember this name, Seborot dextrose agar, SDA, okay? Okay, selective media to selectively inhibit all your other bacteria, and uh, dermatophyte to be increased, okay, the growth. So you can use this cyclohexamide chloramphenicol containing media, okay, which will be incubated at 25 degrees, okay. Then after that, once it grows, then you can see the gross colony appearance and then make an LPCB mount and see the conidiation. Okay, so you will look at the colony characteristic. 
you will look at the microscopic morphology once you make the slide and then you will do some other additional tests okay and a biochemical tests okay so when you have seen the colony of the fungus you will look at the microconidia and and the macroconidia okay so in genus microsporum the macroconidia are numerous lots of microconidia macroconidia are there okay thick walled and rough okay but they have very less microconidia microsporum has rare rarely microconidia okay very rare microconidia on the other hand um, you have the opposite side okay this one had uh, numerous thick walled rough fusiform macroconidia and very rare microconidia on the other hand you have trichophyton which has rare thin walled smooth macroconidia but abundant macrocon uh, microconidia okay and this epidermal phyton it doesn't have any microconidia at all okay but you will see numerous numerous macroconidias okay smooth walled and clavate or club shaped okay club shaped uh, macroconidia now what are macroconidia these larger structures here these are the macroconidia okay and this is the colony appearance you will see the macroconidia here in trichophyton will be pencil shaped they are septated okay these are just fruiting structures of the uh, fungus okay so they may have macroconidia with or without microconidia okay or it may be the other way around so um see this is as i said this is the uh, obverse you are seeing here you will see different depending on the fungus you will see some light fluffy powdery growth or mold appearance okay because these dermatophytes are all molds so in trichophyton species you will see more of microconidia and very less macroconidia sometimes you may not see them the macroconidia okay but most of the time they're there but very less in number okay compared to this microconidia so many teardrop shapes so many Mm, this small small microconidia are there okay so these are conidia the bigger ones are called macroconidia the smaller ones are called microconidia so it has more microconidia and lesser macroconidia okay on the other hand you have microsporum which will have thick walled thick walled rough large macroconidia okay they are spindle shaped okay so this is microsporum species this is the colony again you see lots of this macroconidia and very less or absent microconidia okay then epidermal phyton they have only macroconidia they don't have microconidia at all okay so these are your large clavate shaped club shaped uh, macroconidia okay so these smooth club shaped macroconidia belong to epidermal phyton species and there is no microconidia anywhere you can compare with this one with this one with this one so here you don't have any microconidia in epidermophyton species okay so that's how you will differentiate between these three dermatophytes okay this is another one right so physiological tests you will do a hair perforation test you can remember this you can see for ureas test okay uh, you can see temperature studies and enhancement also okay you can note this then uh, tropic uh, treatment as usual your azoles like itraconazole, itraconazole, okay, you can also have griseofulvin, and if you're using a topical ointment or a gel, then you can use miconazole, clotrimazole, and so on. So, a short note, a uh, short uh, gist, it is not necessary to be an athlete to get athlete's foot, okay, athlete's foot can occur in any area of the skin that is involved with uh, high moisture, like someone keeps wearing uh wet socks okay for example then they can get that they don't have to be an athlete to get you know this uh, athlete's foot okay and there are no worms in ringworm okay that was just a misnomer it's just because of the ring shape appearance of the lesion okay now we go into a short uh, lecture on the topic that we missed last time on hemophilus okay i will just give you a gist of this uh, organism um the important points okay hemophilus is a important cause of pneumonia okay now this hemophilus um, what is pneumonia infection of the alveoli the distal airway and interstitium of lungs okay there is a replacement of normal lung tissue with uh, sponginess by consolidation means hardening and thickening okay so the spongy lung tissue becomes hardened and thickened okay 
so positive agents uh, of pneumonia as uh, short if you get ever get a uh, short note on uh, on pneumonia or or respiratory tract infection then you can write this some etiological causes are here you have bacterial cause viral cause fungal cause causes parasitic causes okay so you can remember two three examples of each in bacteria you have uh, strep streptococcus pneumonia which is the most common cause of uh, of a bacterial pneumonia followed by your hemophilus hemophilus influenzae mycoplasma pneumonia okay so you can remember this and your tuberculosis of course and staphylococcus aureus okay morexella then viral you have your influenza virus please remember influenza viruses is not the same as hemophilus influenzae these are very different things okay influenza viruses for once they are virus okay they are viruses Hemophilus influenzae is a bacteria. Okay, so you have influenza virus, adenovirus, respiratory syncytial virus, even our SARS-CoV-2. Okay, and your other MERS and SARS other variants. Okay, then you have uh, fungal. Okay, so in our fungus also you have like fungus like Cryptococcus or Histoplasma, Sporotrix, Coccidioides. Okay, these can all cause uh, pneumonia. Okay, then even parasitic worms like Strongyloides tercoralis. Okay, this parasite can also cause pneumonia. Okay, so these are your important causative agents of pneumonia. Okay, coming into the important organisms, we will discuss two uh, species within Haemophilus which are of medical concern. One is Haemophilus influenzae, and the other one is Haemophilus ducri. Okay, so this Haemophilus influenzae. Uh, the classification, they belong to bacteria, phylum proteobacteria, okay? Class order, you will remember this, family, Pasteurlaceae, genus, Haemophilus, and right now what we are studying is the species of Haemophilus influenzae, okay? So, they are small to medium-sized cocobacilli, or they can be uh, bacilli also. Bacilli means rods, okay? They are often pleomorphic. They can exist in different forms. Pleomorphism means different different forms. So sometimes they can be cocci, they can be cocobacilli, they can be bacilli. They stain gram negative. Okay, so the gram reaction is gram negative. That means they do not stain with the primary gram stain, the primary dye of gram stain, but they will take the counter stain. Okay, and so they are gram negative. Okay, then they are non motile. Okay, they don't produce spores. If you stain them with ZN stain, then they are non acid fast. Okay? They are aerobe, facultative, anaerobe. Okay? So they can grow both aerobically as well as anaerobically. They have catalase and oxidase reaction are variable, but nitrate reduction test is positive. They are fermenters. Okay? So uh, the genus Haemophilus may require one or both of factor X and V. Okay? These are accessory growth factors required. So the first description was by Robert Koch. Okay, then this is the first free living organism to have its entire genome sequenced. Haemophilus influenzae. Okay, then um, there are encapsulated strains, six serotypes, A to F, and there are non encapsulated strains also. Okay, some of them they have capsules, some of them they don't have capsules. Okay, these non encapsulated strains they cannot be typed because. Uh, the capsule uh, um, classification subtyping is done based on the capsule, okay? So, if they are not capsulated, then you cannot type right now, okay? So, they don't react with capsular typing antiserum, okay? So, disease cause, uh, among these capsulated strains, the most common one is Haemophilus influenza type B, serotype B, okay? Which is also known as HIB, okay? This one, HIB like this it's written like this hemophilus influenza serotype b okay so it can cause a variety of diseases um, normally you can find it in healthy people okay 75 percent of them they will have a normal normal uh, uh, commensal in the um, nasopharynx okay the nose and the pharynx part of the normal people but sometimes they can Harbor Haemophilus influenza type B. Okay. Now, 95% of your H influenzae caused invasive disease are caused by Haemophilus influenza type B, also known as HIV strains. Okay. And 
naturally acquired disease occurs only in humans. It's an opportunistic pathogen. So when you give it the chance to establish its infection, then it'll go like your immunocompromise or the patient is on a ventilator or some kind of manipulation has taken place in the upper respiratory tract, for example. No, That time this infection can go into your lungs and then cause an infection. From the nasopharynx, it'll go down to the... Uh, into the lungs okay and then cause a infection and cause a pneumonia which is usually which is a lower respiratory tract of uh, lower respiratory tract infection okay so you can have meningitis also you can have pneumonia bacteremia means uh, bacteria in the blood okay cellulitis a deep-seated infection of the skin and soft tissue uh, osteomyelitis of uh, inflammation of the infection of the bones then your epiglottis can get inflamed, the joints can be infected, even the pericardium of the heart can be infected by this inf organism, okay? Type B, the most common one. Non-capsulated H influenza usually affects adults. In adults, it will cause uh, ear infection, a middle ear infection called, called otitis media. It can cause conjunctivitis, sinusitis, pneumonia. Even COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease can be exacerbated okay in cystic fibrosis patients okay then you can even cause vulva vaginitis all right so you can have a meningitis you can have uh, ear infection middle ear infection by non typable uh, hemophilus influenzae then you can have sinusitis epiglottitis tracheobronchitis even your pneumonia so even pericardium okay and the, from the heart it can go into the bloodstream causing a bacteremia all right so, there are many of them, uh, many people who are asymptomatic colonizers, okay? But sometimes you can have uh, some viral illness coming and going. It usually happens, you know, the risk factor is uh, household crowding when too many people are together in the house, lower socioeconomic status, rate, race or ethnicity. African Americans are more prone to this disease. People with chronic diseases or sickle cell anemia, or antibody deficiency syndromes, cancer, those who are on chemotherapy, immunosuppression, and males, more than females. Uh, so it causes infection because of these uh, virulence factors. You may remember two of them at least, outer membrane proteins and PRP polysaccharide capsule. The capsule is the virulence factor, okay? So the PRP polysaccharide capsule, you can remember, and you can remember these OMPs, okay? Among the others, it has enzymes, okay? So you can remember two or three of them, like your neuraminidase and your IgA protease, okay? Then um, there is a cross-reacting bacterial antigen to PRP, okay? Then at two to six months, naturally acquired antibody is present, okay? Then uh, adults generally have both bactericidal opsonizing antibody directed against non diabetes H influenzae. The protective level, if you have more than 0.5 microgram per ml of this NDPRP antibody, then you are protected short term. If you develop about 1 microgram per ml, then it gives about long term protection. Okay, That usually you can obtain after completi completing the immunization. You know that uh, there are vaccines available for this bacteria. Okay, So, diagnosis. You can collect the nasopharyngeal aspirates, put them vaginal sap, rarely, not very common. But you, it's preferable to take a lower respiratory tract sample, okay? And if you have conjunctivitis, you take a conjunctival swab. You can have middle ear fluid, okay, through tympanosynthesis, through the tympanum. You can have CSF, you can have blood culture, depending on the presentation, all right? So, gram staining, as I said, they will be gram negative. Here, they have taken the counter stain saffronin's color. That's why they are appearing reddish. Okay, so they are gram negative. They are pleomorphic. You are seeing different types. See, there are chains, there are cocobacilli, there are cocci. Okay, so this is a pleomorphic appearance. It's gram negative. These bacteria are about 0.2 to 0.3 wide and about 0.5 to 0.8 uh, long. Okay, uh, thickness. But they can be slender, they can be long. There is no specific arrangement at all. Sometimes they can be poorly stained, so even if it is gram negative, it might be a light red, okay? Not also. If you want to prolong the staining with 
using dilute carbyl fascin or Loeffler's methylene blue as counter stain, then it gives a stronger color. Understand? Then you may or may not notice a capsule. Not if there is a capsule, there might be some space around the organism. But capsules are best appreciated with capsule staining. Okay. Then for diagnosis, because it's an aerobic facultative anaerobe, you can grow it aerobically also. But whenever you grow it, you have to give it the X factor and the V factor. These things are present uh, in hemolyzed blood. Okay. And there are also special supplement uh, disc tablets that are available that contain these factors. Okay. So, what is X factor? X factor is hemin, okay, or protoporphyrin 9. V factor is NAD or NADP, okay. So, in order for uh, this X and V factor to be released, you can have this disc or you can lyse the blood, okay. Now, when you grow in a blood agar plate, if you streak a Staphylococcus aureus in the center and you streak your suspected hemophilus influenzae, on the uh, perpendicular to it with control strains, okay. So the colonies near that uh, Staph aureus strain, uh, colony will be bigger. And as you go further away from the Staph aureus, okay, then they become smaller. Okay, so you have bigger hemophilus influenza colonies and then it becomes smaller, 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 smaller as you go further away from the Staph aureus streak. Okay, that phenomenon is called satellitism. Okay, you may get a short note on satellitism. What is satellitism? Satellitism is the growth pattern shown by hemophilus influenzae. When you streak it perpendicular to a streak of Staphylococcus aureus, the colonies near the Staphylococcus aureus will be bigger. And as you go further away from the Staph aureus uh, colony, it, the, col the colonies of hemophilus become smaller. This is because the Staph aureus is going to digest the blood Okay, and release this NAD. That is why it, because of the additional factor, it grows healthier. Okay, so you will have bigger colonies. So, the blood culture, for this blood culture, the blood type you will use most commonly is pigeon blood. Okay, it's the best one. But if it's not available, horse, human, and sheep blood can be used. Or you can use chocolate agar. You will grow it at 35 to 37 degrees Celsius. And uh, additionally, give it about the uh, capnophilic environment, 5% CO2, and you incubate around 24 hours. Okay? You can notice this. So, hemophilus influenzae requires both X and V factors in order to grow. Okay? So, if it's not there, it will not grow. Alright? So, if you just have a simple blood agar, it will not grow. But if you have a chocolate agar or a blood agar supplemented with X and V factors, then it will grow. Okay? So, it's an oxidase positive, catalase positive, indole positive, glucose fermenting organism. You will see, if it's capsulated, you will see large mucoid colonies with an iridescence. It's a non lactose fermenter on McConkie, or sometimes it will grow very poorly on McConkie. Okay, it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't grow. Okay, so by giving the X and V factor, you can do a disk test to see if it is actually H influenza or not. If this organism is growing in the presence of X and V factor, then Mm, you can say it is H influenzae. Okay. Then you can do hemagglutination and LEDX particle agglutination as well as PCR to identify the organism. Okay. Then, uh, you know, your common treated, if it's meningitis, then you can give ampicillin for treatment. For example, a third generation cephalosporin for treatment. And if it is sinus sinusitis, you can still use ampicillin. Okay. This is just an uh, example of the treatments. Then you can study the pathogenicity of these organisms by using animals. Uh, so the animals used for this organism study are chinchilla, mice, and rats. Okay? You can Google and find what a chinchilla is. Okay? It's a small rodent-like animal. Okay? Then the mice and rats. Then you can give a immunization for it. As I said, there can be passive by just giving the immunoglobulin, which has low efficacy, as you, you already know. The difference between active and passive immunization, right? So passive immunization is short-lived, all right? Then you have active immunization. You can give polysaccharide vaccines, conjugate vaccines, or combined vaccines in combination with other other vaccines, all right? Then um, if there is a household contact who is susceptible, then they can be given rifampicin, 20 milligram per kg once daily, okay? And if there's a carrier state, then you can also use rifampin. 
So in whom you will give this profile access for hemophilus uh, influenzae type B uh, for all household uh, excluding pregnant female who are um, and contacts less than two years with, in, with less than two years of incomplete immunization, uh, less than two years children with incomplete immunization, immunocompromised children of any age and you have to give it within seven days of the contact. Okay. Now, the other species of importance is Haemophilus ducri. Okay, just a short uh, thing. So, Haemophilus ducri is, uh, you may get a short note on chancroid. Okay, Haemophilus ducri is the causative agent of chancroid or soft chancre. Okay, you know with syphilis, it is called heart chancre, no? So, this Haemophilus ducri causes soft chancre. Okay, it's a sexually transmitted disease. Okay, chancroid or soft chancre caused by H. ducri is a STD, okay? You will find an ulcer on the genitalia with marked swelling and tenderness, okay? So it's painful, this one. It's soft, it is painful, it is red, okay? And the lymph nodes are also enlarged in the surrounding areas. They are also painful, okay? So you differentiate it from syphilis, which causes heart chancre, okay? Chancre, syphilis causes chancre, uh, syphilis due to treponema pallidum causes, presents with chancre and uh, uh, soft chancre or chancroid is because of Tukri. Okay? You can also confuse it with herpes simplex and lymphogranuloma venereum. Okay? Then gram stain, again you will see gram, uh, gram negative bacilli or coco bacilli in strand giving a school of fish appearance if you make it directly from the uh, sample. Okay? So when you do the X and B requirement, no, you might think that this might be hemophilus influenzae, no, but then you test the X and B requirement, okay. So there you will find that it requires the X factor, but it can grow without V factor, okay. So if you put up a plate, uh, a blood agar or nutrient agar plate, you strict the organism, and then you place one disc of X, one disc of V, and one disc of XV, no. So it will grow around the disc with X, Okay, it will um, it will not grow around with V. Okay, it requires X, no, and it will grow on XV also because anyway X is there, right? So it will require X but not V compared to Haemophilus influenzae, which requires both X as well as V. Okay, so even if you have an chancroid infection, there is no permanent immunity. All right, the drug of choice is azithromycin. So you can write this. Okay. This will be a short note. All right. Thank you. Any doubts? Any questions? Hmm? No, ma'am. So you can just make a short note on Haemophilus uh, ducri. Okay. Then Haemophilus okay, influenzae. All right. Then um, mm -hmm. any of your fungal infections can be a potential long or short note. Okay. All right. Okay, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am.